page 318 continued conclusion our study shows that the critical characteristics of a feudal formation are found in the social structure of early medieval india first it is dominated by a class of landlords who claim and collect rent from the peasants on the ground that they are owners of the land second we notice a class of subject peasantry obviously every peasant family constitutes the smallest unit of production and after meeting its needs of subsistence pays the remainder to the landlord peasants actually possess the land but are compelled to pay rents in cash kind or labor to the landlords third the rents and labor services are collected by the landlords not with the object of promoting production or the economic growth of the country but mainly for their own consumption the peasants pay not because of expectations of return <clears throat> but because of custom question legal sanction and ideological influence priests write religious texts which try to prove the low origins and social status of the peasants and producing classes in comparison with those who neither cultivate nor pursue any handicrafts but live on rents religious propaganda is backed by legal enforcement for the landlords claim the rents and services from the peasants on the basis of the land charters granted to them by the king if legal and religious methods fail to pay force is also used by the landlords these are therefore extra economic methods under which a peasant has to operate he does not produce in response to the laws of the market and has little scope for economic growth he functions in response to the needs of his landlord who may take account of the interest of his landlord the king in any case page 319 the peasant can perceive clearly that he is being exploited by the landlord which exploitation cannot be easily seen by the worker in relation to the factory owner fourth the socio economic formation that we have in early medieval times is the concomitant of a predominantly agricultural economy in which local needs are satisfied locally and in which the scope for the functioning of the market system is extremely limited naturally in such a society all services religious military political administrative etc are remunerated through grant of plots of land in the case of lower functionaries and through grants of revenues from villages in the case of higher functionaries finally handicrafts and artisanal activities are confined mainly to the countryside artisans are at- attached either to villages or big estates or temple establishments since there is direct relation between the consumer and the producer traders or middlemen do not play any significant role they only procure and supply iron tools oil spices etc to the rural folk para the process which led to the rise of a class of landlords at the expense of the peasant possession of land really started in the early centuries of the christian era the origin and development of feudalism is to be sought in the land grants made to brahmanas over the first century ad onwards their number becomes considerable in northern india in the gupta period and goes on increasing afterwards the monastery of nalanda owned 200 villages in the reign of harsha villages granted to religious donees by the palas and pratiharas were considerable in number but those allotted by the rashtrakutas were far more numerous one grant ran, one grant mentions 1400 and another 400 villages given in this manner brahmanas and temples were apparently granted land revenues not for rendering civil and military services to their patrons but for spiritual service 
in the benefices granted to them they were allowed fiscal rights and such administrative rights as the maintenance of law and order and collection of fines from criminals. Siwan Sang states that high officers of the state were paid by land grants but such grants are wanting because of the perishable nature of the material on which they were recorded. If Brahmanas were paid by grants, page 320 of revenues, how could the others be paid differently? There is hardly anything to prove that officers and others employed by the state were normally paid in cash. If secular services were remunerated in money, why were religious services left out? In fact, since the priests constituted an important element in society, the mode of payment to them may have set the pattern for others. It was found not only practical but also meritorious and auspicious to pay others by land grants. Inscriptions support the prevalence of the practice and mainly from circa AD 1000. Land was granted by the ruling chiefs to their kinsmen as well as to others who served as vassals and officials. In the period before circa AD 1000, we have more of such grants in Orissa and the Deccan than in Bengal, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. But in the 11th and 12th centuries, we find a sizable number of secular assignees in northern India, particularly in the dominions of the Gaharavalas, Chandelas, Kalachuris, Chalukyas and Paramaras. Para. The process of creating a class of landlords spread unevenly over the country. The practice first appeared in Maharashtra around the beginning of the Christian era. It seems that in the 4th, 5th centuries land grants covered a good part of Madhya Pradesh. In the 5th, 6th centuries they became prominent in West Bengal and Bangladesh, in the 6th, 7th centuries in Orissa, in the 7th century in Assam, in the 8th century in Tamil Nadu and in the 9th, 10th centuries in Kerala. In order to find new avenues of wealth for Brahmanas and to bring virgin land under cultivation, the process of land grants started in outlying backward and tribal areas first. When it was found useful by the ruling class, it was gradually extended to Mid India or Madhya Desha, which was the civilized part of the country and the epicenter of Brahminical culture and society. Para. Attention has been drawn to the absence of land grants in the Punjab in early medieval times. Footnote 2. This situation looks intriguing because land grants in early medieval times formed a regular mode of payment for religious and secular services almost all over the country. One could argue that possibly land grants in the Punjab were not met for religious purposes and hence they were recorded on such perishable material as pieces of cloth or the bark of the birch tree, page 321. But this explanation may not be satisfactory. In the major part of the country, the practice of land grants is linked with the decline of trade and commerce with the decay of towns and with lesser use of money. But the situation seems to have been different in the Punjab. The Chinese traveler Siwan Sang refers to the flourishing towns in Haryana and the Punjab in the 7th century. One is Thanesar where merchandise from all the other parts of the country was collected and the other is Multan which continued to be a center of trade according to the Arab accounts and under the sultans. A 9th century inscription refers to a place called Pehoa in the Karnal district which was a great center of horse trade. The Chinese traveler who speaks of the availability of gold, silver, copper and iron in different parts of the Punjab 
Interestingly enough, in the period between 650 and 1000, the Punjab possesses a regular series of coins which is in sharp contrast to the situation obtaining in the Pala, Pratihara and Rashtrakuta kingdoms and also in the Kingdom of South India in early medieval times. From the middle of the 7th century, we have the coins of the Shahis of the Punjab and Afghanistan. These were made of mixtures of gold and silver, and they were also made exclusively of silver and copper. The neighboring area of Kashmir also had a regular series of coins in the same period. Although the gold coins of the Shahis are very few in number, large-scale use of silver coins and particularly of copper would suggest not only more trade and commerce, but also the use of money even in ordinary transactions. This would naturally obviate the need for payment through land grants. As a possible consequence, the Punjab, where even the Kshatriyas could act as, as priests, and where the Brahmanas did not find conditions congenial even in the early Christian centuries, did not have a strong class of Brahmana beneficiaries based on the possession of landed property. Para. Whatever may be the position in the Punjab, the epigraphs of North India use a rich vocabulary for various types of vassals. Vassals were known as Bhupala, Bhokta, Bhogi, Bhogika, Bhogi Jana, Bhogapatika, Bhogi Rupa, Mahabhogi, Brihad Bhogi, Brihad Bhogika, Raja, Rajani. Raja Raja Naka, Rajya Naka, Ranaka, Rajaputra, Raja Vallava, page 322, Takura, Samanta, Mahasamanta, Mahasamanta Dhipati, Mahasamanta Ranaka, Samantaka Raja, Mandalika. <coughs> <coughs> and probably Mahamandaleshwara. Epigraphic records refer to grants made to Mahasamantas, Ranakas, Rajaputras and Mandalikas and some others but others also seem to have been endowed with land. Of these big vassals were given the of these, big vassals were given the privilege of using the five great musical instruments. The chief obligation of the vassals was to render military aid to their lords. Whether a similar obligation devolved on the officials who were given feudal titles and paraphernalia is not definitely known, but there is little doubt about their gradual feudalization, especially in Maharashtra and northern India. Para. What distinguished early Indian feudalism was the provision for fiscal units of 10 or 12 or 16 villages and their multiples. The Law Book of Manu, a work of the 1st, 2nd century AD, lays down that collectors in charge of 10 villages or their multiples should be paid by land grants. These units persisted in the Rashtrakuta and to some extent in the Pala dominions. But in the kingdoms of the Gurjara Pratiharas and their vassals and successors, the Chehmanas, Paramaras and Chaulukyas prevailed units of 12 or 16 villages or their multiples. Some were handed over to the members of the ruling family as personal estates, but others were possibly fiscal units placed under officers paid by land grants. Apparently, these new units were imposed by the Rajputs on the subjugated population. It is, a hypothetical, it is hypothetical whether they had any Central Asian parallels and whether, like the German invasion in Europe, the penetration of the Hunas and Gujaras provided any external stimulus to the growth of feudalism. Para. The socio-economic aspect of feudalism in India was intimately connected with the transformation of the Shudras who were treated as the common helots, H-E-L-O-T-S, of the three higher Varnas into peasants from the Gupta period onwards. 
In the older settled areas, Shudra laborers seem to have been provided with land. In the backward areas, a large number of tribal peasantry was annexed to the Brahminical system through land grants and they were called Shudras. Therefore, Sivan Sang describes the Shudras as agriculturists, a fact corroborated by Albiruni about four centuries later. Page 323 para. The subjection of the Indian peasantry in early medieval times especially in older settled regions, was a second striking developmental connect connected with the socio-economic dimensions of feudalism. It can be explained by several factors, the most important of which was increase in the burden of taxation on the villagers. The Garhwala grants mention as many as 11 taxes in the villages, if all these were extracted by the state, we doubt whether the peasants were left with even a bare subsistence. In addition to the transfer of these taxes, in many cases the donees were given the right to fixed and unfixed proper and improper taxes. The list of taxes in many grants, for instance in those of the parlors, was not exhaustive and the grantees were authorized to collect taxes covered by the term etc within bracket rd and quote all sources of income unquote sarva ya sameta or samasta pratyaya all this implies that they could make new impositions what the peasants paid as revenues to the state was converted as a result of grants into rents to the beneficiaries, many of whom being prayers or religious institutions did not have to pay any portion of their income as tax to their donees. 3. Para. A second factor that undermined the position of the peasants was the imposition of forced labor. In the Maurya period, slaves and hired laborers were subjected to such labor. But from the 2nd century AD, the practice seems to have been extended to all classes of subjects. Down to the 10th century, the grants of Western and Central India indicate the prevalence of Korve, C-O-R-V-E-E, -E, within bracket Visti. In Bengal and Bihar, peasants were subjected to all oppressions, Sarvapira from which exemption was granted in the villages given to religious donees by the palas. Occasionally imposed by the ruling chiefs upon the villagers, impressed labor was bound to prove oppressive when transferred to local beneficiaries with a direct interest in the exploitation of the rural resources. Para. A third factor that worsened the condition of the peasants was the right of sub infeudation The donees were authorized to enjoy the land, to get it enjoyed, to cultivate it and get it cultivated. Some early medieval law books refer to as many as four stages of landed interests between the king and the actual tiller of the soil which can be also inferred from the epigraphs. The right to cultivate the land or get it cultivated also implies, page 324, the right to eject. A well-established practice in Malwa, Kama, Gujarat, Rajasthan and Maharashtra from the 5th to 12th century, it tended to reduce the permanent tenants to the position of tenants at will. It is not clear whether such a right existed in other parts of northern India, but it seems to have been typical of the pockets which were settled and fairly populated, abounding with cultivators. In backward aboriginal areas, peasants could not leave cultivation and escape to other villages. In some parts of central India and especially in Kangra and Orissa, quite a few villages were transferred to the Donis along with artisans, herdsmen and cultivators tied down to the soil in the same manner as serfs in medieval Europe. Perhaps the practice was rendered necessary by the scarcity of working population for running the rural economy. Para. What adversely affected the peasants in the donated areas was the transfer of communal rights, presumably from the villagers to the donies. 
the boundaries of many gift villages were left undefined and thus could be taken advantage of by the beneficiaries to increase the land in their personal possession. Similarly, the right to barren land, jungles, pastures, trees, water reservoirs, etc., would enable them to tax the peasants for using these. The transfer of such rights obviously flowed from the theory of royal ownership, <coughs> which came to be emphasized in Gupta and post Gupta times. The king claimed taxes on the ground that he was the owner of land. As supreme landowner, he could grant land to the beneficiaries on a large scale. Once the donees received the land, they exercised individual ownership at the cost of the undefined but customary rights enjoyed by the villagers. That there existed certain communal rights can be inferred from the fact that in Gupta times, land could not be sold in Bengal without the consent of the community and that in making their grants, the parlors formally took account of the wishes of the villagers concerned. Thus, the transfer to the beneficiaries of agrarian rights enjoyed by the village to the grantees tended to erode peasant rights and created new property titles. Para. These factors may be taken as various modes of extracting surplus from the peasants for the benefit of either the king and or his secular and religious beneficiaries. Page 3 to 5. They give rise to new property relations and a new mechanism of economic subordination from which there was no escape. Para. How did the peasants react to the process of dispossession and impoverishment? Land grants provide no answer to this question, nor do most literary texts, which are mainly courtly literature. Some texts, however, indicate two possible forms of reaction. One was to leave the country, an old practice referred to in the Jatakas. A passage from the 6th century astronomer Varaha Mihira, quoted in the Shubhashita Ratnakosha, presents the pitiable plight of desolate villages which contain only the dilapidated walls of the houses deserted by unwilling peasants on account of the unwarranted oppression of the fief holder. Bhogapati, footnote 4, whose atrocities are also mentioned in the Harsha Charita of Bana. Similarly, the Brihan Narodiya Purana states that on account of famines and oppressive taxes, people in misery migrate to more prosperous lands. 5. Peasants, however, could not leave villages which were granted along with their inhabitants, for the donees had the legal authority to restrain them. The other possible form which the peasants' reaction to oppressive conditions might take is the assertion of their land rights, as can be inferred from the revolt of the Kaivartas in eastern Bengal, described by Sandhyakar Nandi in the Ramacharita. Hitherto seen either as a popular revolt in which the people asserted their rights against a tyrannical ruler or as a disturbance against the rightful rulers who had been raised to the throne with the consent of the people, the significance of the event can be appreciated better if we bear in mind that the Kaivartas were deprived of their plots of land given as service ten years, six and subjected to heavy taxes. 7. The fact that literally naked soldiers fought with bows and arrows riding buffaloes shows that they were ordinary peasants. 8. Chariots were conspicuous by their absence in the army of Bhima, who led the abortive revolt against Ramapala. 9. Nonetheless, the rising was so formidable and resistance so strong that Ramapala had to mobilize not only his own resources, but also those of all his feudal lords to put down their revolt. It was probably a peasant uprising direct against the Palas who made a common cause, page 326, with their vassals against the Kaivartas. 
but we cannot make too much of this single event for we have hardly anything else to illustrate this form of reaction on the part of the peasants. The usual form of reaction therefore may have been migrations, but these could not be of much avail in the face of the self-sufficient, almost closed economic systems to which the peasants were tied down in early medieval times. Economic conditions and political organization being basically the same everywhere, migrations did not liberate the peasants from the oppression of the princes and beneficiaries. Para. The feudal order was based on more or less self-sufficient economic units functioning in various parts of the country. This is indicated by the rarity of coins, the prevalence of local weights and measures, and the transfer by the kings and chiefs of income in cash and kind from trade and industries to the temples. <coughs> The palace ruled for about four centuries but have left hardly any coins and the same is the case with the Gurjara Pratiharas and Rashtrakutas. In South India also except stray coins of the Chaulukyas of Badami, no coins are found between the 4th and the 11th century. Coins mentioned in Chehmana and Sena records have not been actually found. Although coins are found in the Punjab, Kashmir and Southeast Bengal, their bearing on economic relations in early medieval times needs investigation. On the basis of what we know, it can be said that coins revived on a considerable scale in Western and Central India only in the 11th century, which again may be linked with the revival of trade and commerce and probably the disappearance of Visti during that period. But leaving aside this area and period, it seems that local needs were met locally. Para. The decline of trade and pretty commodity production is also indicated by the decay of urban sites. 10. Archaeology shows that the Kushana layers belonging to the 1st to the 3rd centuries AD are flourishing. The Gupta layers belonging to the 4th, 5th and 6th centuries AD are in state of decline and in many cases Gupta bricks used in Kushana structures. In many urban sites habitation disappeared after the 6th century AD. This is true of a number of towns such as Sanghol in Ludhiana, Purana Kila in Raprastho, Hastinapura, Mathura, Kosambi, page 327, Shringavedapur near Alabad, Varanasi, Piprava, Vaishali, Chirand, Rajagriho, Champa, etc. The same position obtains in Maharashtra, Karnataka and Andhra. It is significant that Nigama, which earlier meant a town, came to mean a village in early medieval times. This became a period of military camps and Jayas Kandhavaras from which royal charters were issued. If we take into account all these factors, it would appear that marketization had reached a low ebb and local needs had to be satisfied on a local scale. Therefore, it was in this period that they had developed the Jajmani system. Since artisans did not have much scope for the sale of their products in towns, they moved to villages where they catered to the needs of the peasants who paid them at harvest time in kind. The Jajmani system was reinforced by the charters which insisted on peasants and artisans sticking to their villages. Some grants laid down that tax-paying artisans and peasants could not be introduced into a granted village from outside, the purpose of this being that grants should not disturb the self-sufficient economy of the villages. Monasteries and temples formed wide economic units, some of them comprising more than a hundred villages. Apparently some villagers supplied grain, others cloth and still others labor for the repair of buildings or else every village furnished part of these articles. Para. The historical role of early Indian feudalism was significant for several reasons. 
First, land grants served as an important means of bringing virgin soil under cultivation in central India, Orissa and eastern Bengal. The same was true of South India, although it has not been covered in our study. All in all, early feudalism was a phase of great agrarian expansion. Enterprising Brahminas were given useful employment in the back, backward aboriginal tracts where they could spread new methods of cultivation. Some beliefs and rituals sponsored by the press helped material progress among the tribal people. Thus, the idea that the killing of a cow was as bad as homicide helped towards the preservation of cattle wealth, so essential for agriculture. The priests taught the primitive people not only the use of the plough and manure, but also fostered agriculture by giving them the knowledge of seasons and planets, especially of the recurrence of the rains. The connections of various agricultural operations, page 3 to 8, with different constellations, nakshatra, were made widely known. Much of this knowledge was written down in the form of the Krishi Parashara 11, which seems to have been a product of this period. Second, land grants provided the administrative mechanism for maintaining law and order in the donated areas in which all such powers were delegated to the donees. Both in the settled and backward areas, the religious donees inculcated among the people a sense of broad loyalty to the established order. The grateful Brahmanas invented fictitious family trees for the ruling chiefs of the early medieval period, tracing their descent back to the solar or lunar dynasties and stressing their divine power, and thus provided validation for new ruling families. On the other hand, secular vassals helped their lords by governing their fiefs and supplying troops in times of war. By governing 